Our speaker tonight is uh, one of the two associate vicars. Um, David Walker, as you know, is one of the associate vicars, but much longer standing as associate vicar is Nikki Lee, has been the associate vicar here for many years and been on the staff here for a very, very long time. Um, uh, uh, Nikki and Scylla, as you know, are our greatest friends from way back since, um, yeah, since childhood, basically. Um, and uh, Nikki's a lot older than me, as you can probably see. <laughs> Just a few months. Um, but uh, um, Nikki and Scylla run the marriage course here, and I really want to commend it to you. If you are married and you've never done this course, then may I really encourage you to do it. It really will transform your marriage. It's not just about marriages that are in difficulty. It helps those as well. But this is about every marriage. If you have a good marriage, it will help you to have a great marriage. If you have a great marriage, it will help you to have an even greater marriage. So uh, I, I commend it to you. And the 16th of March is a key date. Um, that's kind of launch time. And uh, if you have friends, it's not just for you. You might have friends, particularly people outside the church who say, well, everyone can benefit from this. So you can explain that it's not just for people. It doesn't mean there's no kind of shame going through the door, going on the marriage course. It's a great thing to do. And about half the people who go on the course are people outside the church. In fact, it's often the way that people come into the church. We have a couple in our group this time. That's how they came. They went on the marriage course. They really loved it. Now they come on Alpha. So it's a great way to introduce friends. who might not come on the Alpha course, but they'll come on the marriage course. They also run the marriage prep course for the, those couples who are engaged. And uh, that's, that's a great thing. Again, half the couples who come on that are people outside of the church. So this is, these are amazing ministries of the, the church. And if you want to know more about it, the marriage book, the parenting book downstairs are great books to read. Actually, the marriage book is a great book to read if you're, if you're not married. Because there's so much wisdom about relationships that Nikki and Silla pass on in that Anyway, you don't have to read the book because the man's here himself. So would you give a very warm welcome to Nikki Lee. Thank you, Mr. Gumbel, so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Golly, I don't think I can live up to an introduction like that. But do please still read the book because I'm not going to be covering <laughs> the marriage book tonight. We're continuing, as you've heard, our series in 1 Peter. Uh, what this means to be a radical community. And before we look at our passage, let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are the God who speaks to us. And we pray tonight, Lord, you would speak through your word to every single one of us. Speak to our hearts, Lord. And we pray that we would be changed on the inside, that we might be changed in how we live our lives. For Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. We're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 2. If you've got a Bible, you can turn to it. If you've got an iPhone, uh, do get it out. 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 to 12. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. 
Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he comes to visit us. I want to, this evening, concentrate particularly on one verse. And it's verse 9, and if we could have it up on the screen, please. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. What does that mean? And particularly, what does that phrase in the middle there mean, a royal priesthood? Some of you, I suspect, have not a clue, and I am so glad that you're here this evening, because I hope you will have a clue by the time you leave. Others of you have got some idea. I hope by the time you leave today, you will have a deeper understanding. You are a chosen people. The key to understanding what this verse means is that God chooses a part in order to bless the whole. God chooses a part to bless the whole. There is a difference between choosing and planning. Uh, for my wife, Scylla, and I, there was a certain amount of planning that went into uh, having our four children. And I remember very well, uh, what was it, about 35 years ago now, Scylla and I, we were living in Japan at the time, we were camping, we were sitting around a little campfire we'd built, and we were weighing up whether or not we should start trying to have a child. And I remember very well, I had a bit of paper. On one side of the bit of paper, I wrote pros. On the other side of the bit of paper, I wrote cons. And we listed all the pros and all the cons that we could think of. And the cons narrowly outweighed the pros. So I remember Scylla and I decided we would wait a bit before we started having children. What we didn't know was that while we were having that conversation, Scylla was already at least three weeks pregnant. <laughs> So we were slightly overtaken by events. Now, there is a difference between planning and choosing. About three years after that, uh, we were living up in the north of England in Durham, and we went to have lunch with a family who had uh, some children of their own, I can't remember how many, and they had one boy that they had adopted. And this boy they had adopted 10 years previously. He was an orphan in the Vietnam War. In fact, he had been left on the roadside, just a, a few weeks old, sort of just with rags around him. He had a wound on his head, and somebody had put a board with a red cross on it. And some organization, it may have been the Red Cross itself, had seen this baby, had picked it up, uh, put sort of proper clothes on it, put a proper bandage around this baby's head. And then this family in Durham had, had offered to adopt this young baby. And when we went to lunch, the, he had grown up to be a 10-year-old boy, absolutely the most gorgeous, beautiful 10-year-old boy. And I remember at the end of lunch, he went to get a set of photographs, and he showed us these black and white photographs of, first of all, this little bundle lying beside the road with the red cross on the placard, and then him uh, dressed, and then him being held by his, by his adoptive parents. And I remember him saying to us, I may not have been planned, but I was chosen. And God says to us, to every single one of us, you are a chosen people. I've chosen you for my uh, purposes. Now, Peter says as well, not just a chosen people, but a royal priesthood. We are sons and daughters of the king of the universe. Uh, Prince Charles didn't earn his royal title. He didn't do anything at all. He just was born into the royal family. So he became a prince. And we, certainly, we don't earn that royal title. 
But the Bible says we were chosen before the creation of the world to be adopted into the king's family. The question for us tonight is, why did God choose us? Why? And we go back to that key principle. God chooses a part in order to bless the whole. And actually, you see this as a theme that runs all the way through the Bible. And I'm indebted to a book by Graham Tomlin. Graham's books, he's the principal of our theological college. All of Graham's books are absolutely amazing. But this is his most recent book, The, the Widening Circle. And this is the theme that he explores and expands. How right at the beginning, when God creates the heavens and the earth... He chooses a part of his creation, human beings, in order to take care of the whole, in order to bless all of creation. That's why it's so important. We look after the environment. We're not to abuse it. We are a part of God's physical creation. And then when you go on through the story of the Old Testament, you see that God chooses one nation, the nation of Israel. Let's look for a moment at uh, Exodus 19, verse 5. It'll come up on the screens, where God says, Now, if you obey me fully and keep my co covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words, he says to Moses, you are to speak to the Israelites. And you'll have noticed there, keep that up for a moment if you would, Exodus chapter 19. You'll have noticed those words, my treasured possession. Do you remember when Peter says, God's special possession and a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Peter picks up these words from the uh, Old Testament. Now why? Why did God choose Israel out of all the nations? And in the Old Testament, God makes it very clear. It's not because you were more numerous, you were not. Started just from uh, one man and his wife, Abraham and Sarah. You were tiny. Not because you were more powerful. He says, not because of anything that you have done. God says, I chose you because I love you. And you're not to be cruel to other nations, to think that you're somehow superior to them because I have chosen you. Rather, the nation of Israel is called to be a blessing to all the nations. God chooses a part to be a blessing to the whole. And then from uh, the tribe of Israel, uh, from the nation of Israel, God chooses one tribe, the tribe of Levi, who are to be the priests. These they are to serve in the temple, they're to offer sacrifices. And this tribe, as the priest, is to be a blessing to all of Israel. And then, when we come to the New Testament, we see that God chooses one man, Jesus, to bring his blessing to all people everywhere. I've already indicated to you that in this passage in 1 Peter 2, Peter doesn't just quote from the Old Testament, he uses Old Testament language. And this is why it is so well worth reading the Old Testament as well as, as, well as the New. And I, I, I probably talk about it every sermon that I preach, but that is why I love reading the Bible in, in one year. And actually, I love reading Nick and Pips's comments on it too. Because if you read the Bible in one year, you read the whole thing, you read all of the Old Testament. Now, you may say, I couldn't read all that. Uh, but why don't you, if you're reading the New Testament and the Psalms, say this year, why don't next year, why don't you decide, oh, I'm going to seek to read the Old Testament. And if you read that Old Testament passage each day from the Bible in one year, it'll take you about seven minutes, something like that, not more than that, you will read the whole of the Old Testament in a year. And it will help you to see God's plans and how all of God's plans are fulfilled in Jesus. They all point to Jesus. And here uh, in this passage that we've heard, Peter talks about the temple. In the Old Testament, the place where God dwelt. And Jesus says, the temple, this is me now, my body. 
And he says, and now, now you, Christians, are to be built together with me. This is the place where God dwells, right here in our midst, because we have got together. And then Peter talks about the sacrifices, all of those hundreds of animal sacrifices in the Old Testament. They are all pointing to the sacrifice of God's only Son on the cross. And because of the cross, because Jesus took all of our sins on himself, once for all, for all people, for all time, there is no need for any more sacrifices. And then the priesthood. Jesus is described as the great high priest, the, the, the mediator, the only mediator between God and man to bring us, to unite us with God. And there's no need for any other mediator. We can relate directly to God now through Jesus. What does it mean then for us to be the royal priesthood? Well, first of all, it, it, it doesn't mean that we are some sort of exclusive group. Peter is talking about all Christians. Now, people from every different nation and tribe, ethnic group, all made up to be the uh, royal priesthood. And uh, not to be mediators between God and man to connect people to God. Because as I've said, anyone now can have a direct connection with God. And those of you on the Alpha Weekend, some of you I know, you have realized that for the first time when you invited the Spirit of God to come to fill you. God's Spirit bore witness with your spirit that you are God's child, that you can talk to God, that you can listen to God, that God comes. There's a direct connection between you and God. The, you don't need any mediator other than Jesus himself. Thank you. Amen. Peter tells us what it does mean to be the royal priesthood, and he talks about it in terms of three relationships that all of us are to nurture. The first relationship that we are to nurture as the royal priesthood is our relationship with God. You see, again, when you look back at the Old Testament, you see that priests worship. And we are called to worship. And actually, the sacrifice that we bring now, we don't do animal sacrifices. We don't need to do that. Our sacrifice is our worship and our praise. And that's why when we get together, we sing together praises to God. And then the sacrifice is the sacrifice of ourselves. We bring ourselves to God. And those priests in the Old Testament, they were consecrated. And, and Peter actually describes us not just as a royal priesthood, he also talks about us as a holy priesthood. Stephen Foster last week was talking about what it means to be holy, to be set apart for God. Uh, let me just look with you at that passage in uh, another passage in Exodus where the priests are consecrated, where uh, God says this to Moses, slaughter the, there was one ram, slaughter the other ram, take some of its blood and put it on the lobes of the right ears of Aaron and his sons. These, this was the beginning of the priesthood and Aaron is part of the tribe of Levi. On the thumbs of their right hands and on the big toes of their right feet, then splash blood against the sides of the altar. And take some blood from the altar and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and his garments and on his sons and their garments. Then he and his sons and their garments will be consecrated. It's so fascinating when you, when you read the Old Testament and you see these details. The blood was to be on their ears because they were to be sensitive to God's voice. The blood was to be on their thumb because they were to commit to God everything that they did with their hands, everything they did with their lives. It was to be on their toe because they were to commit to God every place that they went. And this is true for us too. Now, with the Old Testament priests, notice the blood was splashed on them, splashed on them, and then it was splashed on the altar, and the anointing oil was on the outside. Now, the problem was, because it was external, it didn't change their hearts. So, as a result, the priest kept going astray, just as the nation of Israel kept going astray. But for us, 
It is the cross of Jesus and the Spirit that changes. And these things are internal. See, God comes by His Spirit to apply the effects of the cross on our hearts to change us on the inside that we might be changed on the outside. And that incidentally is why when we take communion, we drink the wine to take it internally to remind us that Jesus comes to dwell within us by His Spirit. So first of all, in relation to God, we are to consecrate ourselves to Him with our worship and with our lives. Then secondly, in relationship to each other. A solitary Christian is a contradiction in terms. Somebody who says, well, I'm just going to worship God on my own. I'm just going to listen to Tim Hughes on my iPhone at home. I'm just going to worship God in my garden. I'm going to witness to people where I am on my own. The Bible never recognizes that. And notice that all of Peter's words, they're collective words. You are a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. And then he says, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. Can we have verse five back up on the screen, please? He says, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Notice Peter says, you like living stones are being built together. Uh, one stone <laughs> on its own doesn't do much good if you want to have a building. The stones have got to be put one on top of each other. And Peter talks about being built together. Uh, I brought with me two stones, which are actually, I brought them down from Onslow Square. Onslow Square, the church down there, is built of Kentish ragstone. This is a, actually a very soft stone. And don't worry, I haven't taken it out of the church building itself, <laughs> Nikki. I have taken it from a little wall that's just in front of our house there. But the trouble is this wall keeps falling down. And the reason it keeps falling down is because you can see these stones, they're, not, they're just rough, they're not dressed stones. So you can't sort of join them together. How much sort of mortar they put in between, the thing keeps falling apart. I don't know if any of you have been to Jerusalem, but if you have, you might have been to the temple there. And if you go underground, you see Herod's temple. That was the temple which Jesus went to. And you see these massive stones. I mean, they are impressive for their size. But what is even more impressive is the way that these stones are dressed. That means that they are, they are smoothed off, so they absolutely fit together. And it's because those stones fit absolutely perfectly together that that building was incredibly strong and magnificent. And that is what Peter says is to happen to us. We are like sort of rough stones. You know, there are all sorts of... Oh, sorry, there are a few bits. I hope the verges don't mind. All sorts of bits that stick out, jagged edges... And actually, it's only as we are sort of rubbed together and some of these bits get knocked off, then we are built together. And that's why we lay so much emphasis on the connect groups, these groups that meet together midweek. This is where we get to know each other. This is where we discover each other's needs, where we pray for each other, where we help each other. We can't be a radical community unless we get to know each other. Uh, and let me just say this too about the um, being built together and the leadership conference. You know, it occurred to me when I was reading this passage and preparing this evening, the leadership conference is about God's church being built together. And as you heard Nikki say, this is a historic occasion when we have one of the foremost preachers from the Roman Catholic Church, Father Nero Cantalamessa, and then one of the most prominent speakers from the Pentecostal Church, both coming on the same stage together, wanting to hear each other ministering to us. And, you know, between the Catholic Church, the Pentecostal, I suppose we're sort of somewhere in the middle, aren't we? I don't know whether 
God means us to be a little bit like a bit of glue, a bit of cement. I don't know. But this is a historic time. As, remember, Jesus said, it's by the way you love one another. that People will know that you are my disciples. And I think what is going to happen in the Albert Hall and in the Apollo on May the 4th and the 5th is going to be a historic moment of God building us together like living stones. And I hope, I pray along for, let's say half of this congregation was there at the Apollo, sitting nearby each other. This service would be, we would just be different. Not just spending two days worshiping, hearing God's word, but rubbing together, God building us together. That's the second thing in relationship to each other. And then thirdly, in relationship to the world. God chooses a part to bless the whole. God's longing is that every single man, woman, and child would come to know him, come to know his love for them, his purpose for their lives, the freedom that he gives. And this is what Peter writes in verse 12, if we could have that up again. He says, live, you have to look halfway down this slide, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. When he says live such good lives, Peter's not thinking of people sort of being legalistic or smug or sort of tutting at the behavior of those around them. It's not there to make people feel guilty around them. Rather, living such good lives, these good deeds are to do things that build up the people around us and build up their relationships and not doing things that destroy people's lives or their confidence or their reputation. And that's why he says in verse 1, therefore rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. You may be the only Christian in your family. You may be the only Christian in the place where you work or in the house where you live, or indeed perhaps, you, as far as you know, maybe in the block of flats where you live, or in the neighborhood where you live, for all I know. And God has chosen you for a purpose, to be part of this royal priesthood in the place where you are. If I say the letters P. S I. Does that mean anything to anybody? P S I. Just nod if it means something to you. I see. Pra- I see nobody nodding. Shows my age. You're right, Nikki. I am. Uh, P S I means pounds per square inch. When you're blowing up your tires, that's what used to be on the gauge at least until it went metric. <laughs> anyway, P S I. You may may sort of see it in the future, and uh, it'll sort of may just ring a bell. Because when I wrote down three words. I saw that these were the letters that they begin with. And this is what you are to do if you are the the only Christian in in your your setting. And the P stands for pray. I read just recently in the Bible in one year that in uh, Exodus, uh, Aaron, when when his whole sort of tunic was being made, he had this breast piece that had the a stone with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel so that every time he went into the Lord's presence, he brought with him the whole tribe of Israel. And that is what we do when we pray, whether it's when we bring to God our our family or our workplace or the place where we live, we bring to God. And, you know, you don't have to have been a Christian for more than 10 minutes. You don't have to have beautiful prayers. You don't need to be able to quote the Bible. You don't need to long prayers. But you just come before God and just say, God, I bring you 
my family. I bring you my workplace. I bring you where I live, whatever it is, whichever group it is that God has put on your minds where he has called you to be the royal priesthood. And if there are one or two other Christians where you work, get together with them. Pray with them. P, pray. S stands for serve. This teaching of Peter's, live such good lives among the pagans. This teaching had a dramatic effect in the ancient world. I remember recently reading an article by Charles Moore, and he was writing about the fear that many people feel when there is a, a virus, uh, like the Ebola virus actually going on in Africa, or, or like when the swine flu virus sort of threatened, really threatened us. Uh, and he was writing about how there were plagues in the uh, second and third centuries, and the, what the Christians did in the wake of those plagues, uh, plagues. And this is part of his article. He said, instead of fear and despondency, the earliest Christians expended themselves in works of mercy that simply dumbfounded the pagans. This love took on very practical, concrete forms. In Rome, the Christians buried not just their own, but pagans who had died without funds for a proper burial. They also supplied food for one and a half thousand poor on a daily basis. In Antioch, in Syria, the number of destitute persons being fed by the church had reached 3,000. During the plague in Alexandria, when nearly everyone else fled, the early Christians risked their lives for one another by simple deeds of washing the sick, offering water and food, and consoling the dying. Their care was so extensive that Julian, the emperor, eventually tried to copy the church's welfare system. It failed, however, because for the Christians, it was love, not duty, that motivated them. In the midst of intermittent persecution and colossal misunderstanding, and in an era when serving others was thought to be demeaning, the followers of the way, as Christians were then known, instead of fleeing disease and death, went about ministering to the sick and helping the poor, the widowed, the crippled, the blind, the orphaned, and the aged. The people of the Roman Empire were forced to admire their works and dedication. Look how they love one another was heard on the streets. And it was as a result of that radical community that the church grew. More recently, in, in modern times, in China, in Sichuan, there was an earthquake in 2008 that was one of the worst earthquakes ever recorded. Some 71,000 people died, 374,000 were injured, and four. 0.8 million were left homeless. And five years later, there was an article in the Times which went like this. Five years on, the earthquake has had another lasting legacy. Church attendance has risen by a third since the earthquake struck. Pastors in the worst affected areas have reported not only an immediate influx of new Christians into the church, but that this has been sustained. It's an interesting situation in a country where evangelizing is illegal and Bibles are frequently too expensive for the rural poor to buy. Much of this growth has come about because of the witness of Christians who provided shelter and comfort for their neighbors affected by the quake. We, like those first Christians, are called to be a radical community serving those around us. We, like those Christians who moved into the area in Sichuan after the earthquake, we've heard it many times in China, the effect of that. We are called, like them, to serve those around us, to be a radical community. And then finally, the I. And the I stands for invite. All are welcome to become a part of God's chosen people. God extends his arms wide. And Jesus extends his invite to others through us. Through inviting people to come and join us here on a Sunday. Through inviting them to 
come to do the Alpha course, or inviting them, as Nikki was talking about earlier, to come to do the marriage course, or the marriage prep course, or come to the marriage course party. You know, as, as Archbishop William Temple once said, the church is the only organization that exists for the benefits of its non-members. You, writes Peter, are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And God has chosen us, he's chosen you, and he's chosen me to be a part of this radical community, to be the royal priesthood, to be a blessing to every nation on this earth.